Well, look, um, good afternoon, um, everybody. And, and as chairman of the British Kazakh Society, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you all to this important official BKS webinar, uh, which is focusing on soft power and particularly how the UK is using soft power to engage with, with Kazakhstan. Now, as you all know, the British Kazakh Society aims to promote the best of relations between our two countries, including highlighting trade and investment opportunities and promoting cooperation at all levels between government, finance and industry. And we place a strong emphasis on promoting understanding about international affairs and diplomacy. So this webinar uh, on soft power really falls squarely within our remit. With its geographic uh, strategic location and dominant position in Central Asia, modern Kazakhstan has developed a key international role along a sophisticated approach to foreign policy and Erlan has played an enormous role uh, in this. The United Kingdom has a vast array of state assets capable of being deployed via soft power mechanisms. Both countries in their own ways are powerful and influential players in the global soft power landscape. The term soft power was, co was coined by Joseph Nye over 20 years ago, and he has written extensively on public dip diplomacy and soft power. Soft power describes the ability of a state to influence the actions of others through persuasion or attraction rather than coercion. In today's world, with the shifting geography of political power and the changing no nature of global affairs, the opportunities for projecting soft power have transformed dramatically. With this heightened awareness of soft power comes the strength and potential to project influence. We have much to learn this afternoon about how the UK and Kazakhstan are le leveraging their respective soft power advantages. Today we have three speakers with very special insight about the trends mechanisms and role of soft power. First is Paul Brummel, who has had a very distinguished career in the Foreign Office, joining in 1987. He has served in Islamabad, Rome, and has been ambassador to Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, and Romania, as well as being High Commissioner to Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean. He is now the head of soft power and the External Affairs Department of the Foreign Office. Secondly, I'm thrilled to welcome His Excellency Erlan Idrisov. We are particularly fortunate to have such a distinguished ambassador for Kazakhstan appointed to London. And as you know, he has served twice as foreign minister and successfully led Kazakhstan's candidacy to be a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council for 2017-18. He has been a strong advocate for Kazakhstan on the world stage. Thirdly, we have Rowan Kennedy, who is country director of the British Council, based in Almaty, and overseeing a portfolio of programs in education, science, social development, and the arts, all vital levers of UK soft power. This uh, BKS webinar is part of our digital strategy and follows on from our recent networking events, including those with the Foreign Minister of Kazakhstan, the Chairman of Kazinvest, Lady Judge of the AIFC, George Hollingbury, when he was Minister of State at the DIT, uh, Mike Gifford, obviously our ambassador to Kazakhstan, and we had a major BKS dinner at the House of Lords earlier this, uh, this year. Our panellists have very kindly agreed to answer questions, and these will be undertaken following the keynote uh, presentations. So without further ado, it is a particular pleasure for me to welcome Paul Brummel, distinguished member of the FCO, who is also a fellow geography graduate from Cambridge University. Uh, all, the floor is yours. Rupert, thank you. Thank you so much. And it's a real pleasure to, uh, to, be, to be here and to be um, engaging again with the, uh, with the British Kazakh Society. It was a real pleasure and an honour to be UK ambassador to Kazakhstan between 2005 and 9, working very closely with the society at, at, at that, that stage. Uh, and it's great to see you're still in such uh, wonderful hands. Um, we've got um, Ambassador Idrisov uh, and Rowan will talk about um, how, in turn, how Kazakhstan approaches its soft power and how 
the UK is engaging in Kazakhstan using our soft power. So I thought I would kind of start with uh, some more general comments about soft power as a theme and how the UK government is approaching it. Um, as Rupert has said, soft power is a term which was coined by a US academic, former politician called Joseph Nye. It's relatively recent in origin. It dates just from 1990 uh, from a book by Nye called Bound to Lead, which looks at US strength in military, economic and soft power. Nye defines the term as the ability to get what you want through attraction rather than coercion or payments. And what he argues is that in international relations, the importance of soft power has been neglected, at least since the time of Machiavelli, in favour of a fo focus on hard power, on military muscle and economic strength. So he found, for example, that the United States government, when he did his research, spent 400 times more on hard power than on soft. And he argued that there are three basic sources of soft power, a country's culture, its values, and its international behavior or its foreign policy. So the country with a culture which attracts others, whose values attract others, and whose behavior on the international scene attracts others, is richer in soft power. And I argue it's more likely to be able to persuade others to support its policies by virtue of this strength of attraction. And soft power is central to the work of the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office. So as Rupert's mentioned, I head a department which is devoted to the theme. Amongst other things, we sponsor the British Council, we deliver Chevening and Marshall scholarships, and we fund the BBC World Service World 2020 programme. The Foreign Office, in common with other foreign ministries around the world, is both a producer and a user of soft power in relation to that part of it which derives from a country's foreign policies. Um, physical presence is an important starting point. Uh, the global Britain uplift of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office has created the opening of 12 new posts worldwide. But soft power is not just about being there. It's also about engagement, active willingness to work with the international community to tack ma tackle major threats and challenges. So the UK has worked to highlight issues like sexual violence and conflict, the illegal wildlife trade, importance of 12 years quality education for girls, media freedom, climate change. Some commentators on the theme argue that development assistance, international aid, is hard power rather than soft, and, and that's based on the argument that it's influence which is purchased. But actually, I think the UK's attitude to development assistance places, places such assistance at the centre of our soft power, our international attractiveness. So the UK is one of the very few major economies worldwide to meet the OECD's target of spending 0.7% of our national income on ODA. But it's not just a matter of the overall scale of assistance. The UK has also de developed a reputation as a global champion for aid spending, for humanitarian relief, for environmental protection, and ev efforts to meet the sustainable development goals. And I think it's important to recognise, though, that soft power deriving from UK foreign policy is not just about development assistance or values-driven campaigns. It's also about every foreign policy decision we take as a whole. The UK looks to work with others across the international community to respond to crises and challenges where they occur and to use in a positive and engaged way our membership of international organisations, including the permanent membership of the UN Security Council. So diplomatic networks are a producer of the foreign policy element of soft power but they're users of the other two elements, culture and values. And I think culture here needs to be understood in its broadest sense, as in Raymond Williams' assertion that culture is a way of life. So the power in launch and finance um, in February, for example, breaks down Joseph Nice of the single world culture into multiple pillars, including not just culture and heritage, but also media and communications, education and science. 
And I think the role of diplomatic missions here is to highlight what's attractive about UK culture. So the Great Britain campaign, for example, which I think everybody has, would have seen, it showcases British soft power strength to encourage people to visit, to do business, to invest and study in the UK. Diplomatic entertainment makes use of British food and drink products, giving rise to a whole new academic sub-discipline called gastro-diplomacy. Diplomatic missions promote British values, for example, in supporting pride events in countries where LGBTQ communities face precarious existences. But I think it's really important at this point to emphasise a really obvious point, but it's a point which is quite often overlooked, which is that soft power, because it's about attractiveness, depends on how the recipient perceives it. It's no good, you know, us thinking what we've got is great if, if those we are promoting it too, don't actually buy it very much. So for soft power to be deployed effectively, a strong understanding is needed of the strengths and aspirations of the host country, a search for common ground, an identification of fertile areas for collaboration. And although cultural soft power is largely independent of government, government is a user, as I've said, more than a producer of this kind of soft power, that doesn't mean that government can't support it. So thus it is that my department in the Foreign Office funds the BBC World 2020 programme, supporting new 12 new language services of the BBC World Service, enhancing its capability to deliver award-winning investigative journalism, while at the same time fully protecting the BBC's editorial independence. We fund the Chevening Scholarships programme, which this year brought some 1,750 future change makers from around the world, including Kazakhstan, to take a master's programme at one of Britain's great universities. And we provide grant and aid to the British Council, whose global network helps to build cultural and educational partnerships worldwide, enriched by UK soft power. So as both the producer and the user, soft power is at the heart of the work of the FCO. Um, I should mention at this point, another rather obvious this point is that we are living of course in unprecedented times and the work of the Foreign Office at the moment as with foreign ministries around the world is rightly and quite heavily focused on quite practical aspects of the response to the Covid pandemic. Brit British citizens around the world get back home against a context of cancelled flights and closed borders sourcing the PE supplies that our health services need. And it's quite tempting to see soft power in this context as, as a kind of nice to do, but not essential. But I would argue that our soft power is actually a key part of our COVID response. That's seen, for example, in the central role played by the UK earlier this week in the virtual meeting of world leaders, which resulted in a pledge of more than 7 billion euro to um, help to research a COVID-19 vaccine. Our Prime Minister Boris Johnson highlighted that the search of that va va vaccine had to be a matter of international cooperation, not of competition, the, most, the, the largest shared endeavour of our lifetimes, as he put it. And I think this sense of a shared crucial endeavour to confront the most pressing problems of our, of our planet, which is at the heart of a soft power approach, is then at the heart of a COVID response too. As I've said, Ambassador Idrisov and, and Rowan uh, will be talking in more detail about Kazakhstan specifically, about Kazakhstan's soft power and how we're engaging with it. So I won't go into detail, but I would just flag up that as Ambassador to Kazakhstan from 2005 to nine, soft power was absolutely at the heart of our approach to the bilateral relationship. And some of the many examples which, which come to mind, uh, you know, with the distance of a, of a decade, um, are really the Bolashak scholars, for example, funded by the Kazakhstan government to take up places at UK universities, drawn by the attractiveness of the UK higher education sector. And our work very closely with the British Council, with the British Alumni Club of Kazakhstan, helping develop a continuing relationship between Kazakh alumni of UK universities and the UK itself. Um, I remember the, al uh, the album Slep, which was produced by 
uh, Welsh composer Carl Jenkins, based on a collaboration with the enormously talented uh, West Kazakhstan Philharmonic Orchestra. And I remember the England football supporters coming to Almaty in 2009 um, for a football match, World Cup qualifier with England. They knew nothing about Kazakhstan when they discovered that England were playing Kazakhstan, but through that match, through the experience of the hospitality that they received when they arrived, became lifelong friends and champions of Kazakhstan. Um, soft power is sometimes depicted as something competitive. So there are a whole set of league tables which demonstrate that the soft power of one country has eclipsed that of another. But I think that's a really odd way to look at something which is about attraction. The strength of soft power is in its encouragement of cooperation rather than competition. And I think it's the stuff of which friendships are made. Thank you. Indeed, for that uh, wide ranging um, and, and comprehensive uh, speech. Uh, and that has produced quite a number of questions actually, which we will uh, come to later. Um, it now um, falls on me to um, uh, introduce um, His Excellency Erlan Idrisov, uh, Kazakhstan's ambassador to London. Erlan, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning once again, everyone. Uh, uh, good early, uh, uh, good, good late morning. Uh, it's uh, right afternoon time in London. Uh, weather is fantastic. I'm so pleased uh, to see you all, but uh, I'm particularly pleased to see Paul, my old good friend and colleague. Uh, we are in touch in this uh, coronavirus times uh, on emails and other forms of uh, distant uh, communication. Uh, we missed each other at the recent uh, summit, uh, which was dedicated exactly to this topic. There was a global uh, soft power summit uh, earlier uh, uh, in the year, where Paul was one of the distinguished panelists together with uh, former UN Secretary General Pan Ki-moon. Um, so I'm uh, very, uh, Rupert, of course, I'm very uh, glad to see you. I recognize already the room because we have so many video <laughs> events. <laughs> I recognize the door and the ceiling and part of the uh, artwork over behind you. you know? <laughs> Rowan, I, I'm very glad to see you also. Uh, and you know that we have uh, with you a special connection through your father and the Warwick University. My youngest son just graduated uh, Warwick University last summer. So uh, that, that's the special relationship I have with, with the British Council <laughs> and the team there. Well, uh, I hope uh, you're all surviving well. Uh, I wish you to continue to stay well and safe, uh, keeping the distances, uh, social distance, uh, washing your hands and uh, wearing masks and gloves. Uh, but I hope that uh, weather will encourage and uh, the skies will encourage uh, our governments and other countries to uh, uh, put more efforts to overcome the uh, virus and uh, uh, bring us all back to uh, normality our economies, our societies, our families, etc. etc. So I wish you all uh, the very best. Uh, on the uh, topic, uh, first of all, thank you to the British uh, Society, Kazakh Society for having this uh, uh, webinar on uh, this very challenging and in a very uh, uh, acute and very timely topic. Uh, it is really a global uh, thing which is being discussed at different panels. As I said, uh, we recently had the first ever Global Summit and Soft Power in London. It was in March, Paul, right? Uh, or, yes, in March. Yes, in March. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, I also uh, will uh, make a few general remarks. Uh, uh, the uh, summit uh, has, uh, we, we, we have uh, uh, many definitions of the uh, soft power, uh, and it is a very uh, diverse uh, phenomenon, but uh, I think. Uh, uh, the summit has uh, offered a very uh, nice platform where uh, all these aspects have been discussed and debated uh, in a very constructive manner. Uh, I think uh, my uh, take uh, from the summit was, in a nutshell, uh, that uh, uh, in essence, uh, uh, soft power, good soft power, proper soft power is about uh, uh, producing, as uh, you, Rupert said, uh, a positive influence, uh, positive messages. Uh, uh, to your partners in the world, but more importantly, I, th I think uh, uh, it is also producing and delivering a public good uh, on a national, regional, and global scale. So that's that's my definition of the uh, of the uh, soft power. The history of soft power 
uh, comes, I think, uh, uh, on stream earlier than the early 90s. I think uh, we were witnesses of the uh, soft power uh, in a, a very special uh, shape during the Cold War, when we had two bipolar, uh, uh, two, uh, pol uh, two poles, uh, with, the, uh, with the West uh, uh, led by the United States and the uh, Socialist Bloc led by the USSR. Uh, of course, it's all started uh, with a kind of a caution and uh, uh, some uh, 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 kind of restraint, but over time, closer to the 90s, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the Cold War becoming cooler and cooler, uh, the soft power of those days uh, started to smack of uh, very uh, brutal propaganda. Uh, that was a very unfortunate uh, development. Uh, Kazakhstan became uh, a part of the other side of the, of the camp, uh, which was raging this uh, 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 Cold War in the information space uh, or the propaganda space. Uh, in the 90s, when the uh, Soviet Union collapsed, of course, uh, this has produced new opportunities. People really understood that uh, uh, hard power should be very seriously complemented uh, by the uh, instruments of soft power. Uh, that has come uh, very seriously uh, online, and uh, we have uh, seen many, many positive examples of the very proper needy, needed uh, soft power. Let's take, for example, Nordic countries for uh, their contribution to the uh, um, uh, development assistance, uh, 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 peacemaking. Uh, we all remember the role of Norway, for example, in the Middle East uh, 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 negotiations. Uh, let's take the example of uh, Japan, which uh, promoted uh, the advance uh, of technologies and uh, industries with their high-tech equipment, cars, uh, uh, electronics, etc., etc. Uh, to a certain extent, at that time, the United States was a uh, brand carrier uh, of the democracy and human rights uh, uh, concepts throughout the world, and uh, it was respected throughout the world. Uh, uh, I uh, specifically say, in uh, certain uh, uh, in certain ways, and in the past, uh, of course, uh, nowadays uh, this uh, role of the United States is under big question. Uh, uh, let's take, for example, the United Kingdom, uh, with its uh, very strong instrument like the British Council. Rowan is uh, representing today uh, um, uh, the British Council here, and uh, uh, my good uh, friend Kieran is my neighbor, Paul. Do you know that Kieran is just next door here uh, on Haymarket in central London? Uh, so uh, these are good uh, positive examples, or let's take individuals like uh, uh, Mother Teresa uh, or Nelson Mandela. These were um, very, uh, very uh, distinguished, uh, very uh, weighty uh, uh, carriers of uh, positive messages and public good uh, globally. Unfortunately, as I said, uh, um, uh, we uh, um, uh, don't have massive uh, uh, examples of uh, uh, this public, positive public good uh, deliverance, uh, delivery, uh, particularly of late uh, when we are in the world of uh, fake news and return to this uh, pro propaganda style, uh, you know, uh, information war. I'll come uh, to that later on. Uh, but uh, uh, Kazakhstan, um, uh, as a young country, uh, found itself uh, uh, as a newcomer. Uh, we, of course, uh, uh, came, uh, first of all, from that part of the world, which was uh, one uh, side of the uh, uh, Cold War propaganda war. Uh, and we had to uh, look around and uh, learn new uh, ways of life uh, internationally and in our region and uh, of course domestically. Uh, we uh, didn't want to blunder, we uh, learned uh, experiences uh, from, from uh, different countries and tried to identify areas where we can deliver public good uh, on a global and regional scale. Of course, uh, this was uh, against the background of a massive reform effort uh, politically and economically in Kazakhstan itself. Uh, that was also projecting uh, new Kazakhstan uh, on the map of the world. But I would identify four big areas where we uh, focused our uh, uh, endeavors to uh, bring uh, uh, good uh, uh, services to the world. Uh, first of all, it is uh, peacemaking and the anti-nuclear uh, movement. Kazakhstan, uh, having suffered uh, from uh, a massive uh, uh, nuclear standoff uh, during the Cold War times, with the uh, largest in the world uh, nuclear testing site in Simpalatinsk, of course, uh, uh, 
uh, focused uh, uh, its efforts on efforts on uh, building a nuclear, nuclear free world and this continues to be a big trademark and brand for Kazakhstan. Uh, contribution to Kazakhstan in this area is uh, widely recognized and Kazakhstan is considered to be one of the champions of the anti-nuclear movement uh, globally. Uh, the closure of the Sipolitinsk nuclear site, the removal of new, uh, uh, more than uh, 1,000 uh, ICBMs, nuclear uh, uh, warheads, uh, from the territory of Kazakhstan, the establishment of the uh, low enrichment uh, uh, nuclear fuel bank in Kazakhstan by, under the aegis of the uh, IAEA, uh, the Iran talks, uh, the uh, Kazakhstan uh, uh, in 2013 uh, resumed and give, uh, gave a kick uh, to the restart of the uh, uh, nuclear uh, uh, program of Iran talks uh, in Almaty and they were successful. Eventually, this ended up in this uh, global agreement, which is under threat now again, but uh, uh, that was our contribution to that. Uh, let's take our initiative on establishing the Central Asia nuclear free zone. These are the areas where we continue to contribute, and uh, that's, as I said, our uh, strongest uh, trademark internationally. Uh, we also focus on peacemaking. We understand that uh, hard power and uh, hard uh, conflicts uh, um, uh, should be uh, seriously complemented, uh, or, or, or resolution of these conflicts should be, should be seriously complemented uh, by development efforts. Therefore, peacemaking is uh, absolutely important for us. And again, Kazakhstan has earned respect and recognition in the world in this respect. Let's take our early efforts by uh, President Nazarbayev to uh, uh, pacify the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, conflict in Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, let's take uh, recent of recent uh, our uh, Astana process uh, on Syrian talks, uh, our earlier efforts uh, to pacify a situation in Ukraine when President Nazarbayev was uh, traveling between uh, uh, Russian, Ukrainian and Western capitals uh, or let's take uh, for example our role we played uh, when there were uh, difficulties, uh, serious difficulties in relations uh, between Russia and Turkey recently after the downing of the uh, uh, Russian uh, fighter jet uh, by uh, Turkey. Uh, this uh, of course uh, uh, contributes to our uh, uh, image uh, as the uh, global uh, uh, contributor to uh, global peace and uh, peacemaking. Uh, in the region, I would identify Afghanistan and our efforts to bring into the context of uh, uh, the global efforts to uh, bring peace to Afghanistan, the regional context, the role of Central Asian countries. Earlier on, we have uh, initiated a massive educational program uh, to train Afghan uh, students in Kazakhstan. By thus, we gave example uh, to uh, Western countries and other partners. We called on them to uh, focus on human capital building in Afghanistan for the future of Afghanistan and we draw attention to the role of Central Asian countries uh, for the future of Afghanistan. This uh, has paid back. Uh, all uh, recent uh, regional uh, support of Kazakhstan, of uh, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan uh, providing the uh, uh, COVID-19 related aid uh, to these uh, two countries, neighbors of Kazakhstan. Uh, the next big area which I would uh, identify uh, is, uh, as I call it, uh, placing Kazakhstan as a new actor globally and regionally uh, on the map. Uh, uh, first of all, of course, uh, we are a new society, therefore uh, we uh, want to project uh, a fast-growing uh, um, uh, uh, society moving towards building a modern, uh, uh, self-sustained, uh, uh, forward-looking nation. Uh, of late, for example, our a peaceful transition uh, uh, from the first president of Kazakhstan to the second president and the efforts to uh, open up the society. Uh, these are uh, all the uh, uh, messages which we uh, try to carry out globally to make sure that uh, uh, we continue to be recognized as uh, an important uh, uh, global and regional actor responsible uh, both externally and domestically. Uh, to that basket, I would add our efforts, for example, to have Expo 2017 with the topic of future energy, which was uh, very important uh, in the global fight for uh, uh, environment uh, salvation. Expo was quite successful. We were the first ever uh, country in the post-Soviet space to have this global, uh, this type of global event, and it went absolutely successfully. Our efforts to attract foreign direct investments huge investment projects. Uh, these are also contributors to uh, our 
uh, soft power uh, efforts or uh, promoting science uh, and education through Bolashak program, for example, or Nazarbayev University, which, which partners with 10 best universities in the world from the United States, from the United Kingdom, it is UCL, uh, from Singapore, uh, or uh, promoting uh, space launches and uh, promoting and developing our space, uh, international space program at the Baikonur Space Station. Of late, I would, of course, identify uh, a financial, Astana Financial Center with the English common law. Again, we are pioneers. We are the first uh, in the post-Soviet space to bring Western uh, legal concept uh, uh, to the territory of the former Soviet Union. This is a, a quiet revolution, which now pays back very seriously. And this is where, uh, by the way, Kazakhstan and the United Kingdom are parting uh, most seriously. Uh, let me also identify new thing, uh, which we try to focus on our history and uh, heritage. As you know, Kazakhstan uh, comes from the ancient nomadic culture, and this nomadic culture uh, uh, turned out to be on the sidelines of the historic process. We believe this is very unfair. Therefore, we have a national uh, long-term program of reviving this spirit spiritual heritage, and uh, we focus on nomadism. The essence of our effort uh, uh, is uh, that nomadism resonates today, particularly in the global effort to uh, bring balance to, uh, with the nature, uh, which is the essence of the uh, fight for the uh, clean, green air, uh, environment and uh, climate change, uh, fighting against uh, the climate change. Because the center of the philosophy and the practice, uh, practical life of nomads was the balance of, with nature. Uh, human beings were absolutely in good friendship and good understanding with the nature, and they were keeping this balance. Therefore, we want to bring this message from our ancient past to modernity uh, as uh, a contribution of nomads and nomadic culture to global civilization. Many things are forgotten. Therefore, through a special program, through research, uh, scientific cooperation, education cooperation, historic cooperation, we are bringing uh, these uh, uh, messages uh, to the world uh, this summer, uh, no, uh, actually at the end of May, we were supposed uh, to open uh, a huge gold, ancient gold of Kazakhstan exhibition in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. Of course, it's being affected by the coronavirus situation. We hope that uh, during the summer we'll open, we'll have the opening when situation eases, we, we will open this uh, fantastic exhibition, uh, first ever uh, uh, experience of Kazakh ancient gold in, in UK, in, uh, in uh, this part of the world. Uh, and uh, this uh, ancient gold uh, uh, brings messages of uh, strong metallurg metallurgical uh, skills of ancient nomads dating back to uh, uh, four, uh, fifth and sixth uh, and fourth uh, centuries BC. So this is a huge, huge uh, cultural message which we will be continuing reinforcing with the support of our partners. Of course, we uh, fo focus on traditional things in soft power, culture. Uh, let me name uh, such names like, like uh, Dimash Kudaybirgen, uh, our fantastic singer. He's a global star. When he was performing in the O2 Center in London, uh, the support teams, the fans uh, of uh, Dimash Kudaybirgen came from Australia, as far as from Australia and New Zealand and Canada. That is a fantastic achievement of a young, uh, young singer from Kazakhstan. Or uh, our uh, film producer and director, Timur Bekmambeta, with uh, 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 you know, blockbusters uh, uh, shot in uh, uh, most film and uh, uh, Hollywood. Uh, or our famous uh, virtuoso, violin virtuoso, Marat Bissingaliev, who is uh, now uh, 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 residing and uh, performing uh, in UK, uh, in Liverpool. But uh, uh, what he is doing now for the world is he is bringing the classical Western music to India. He is the... Uh, a major uh, uh, kind of uh, engine uh, for developing the Indian uh, Philharmonic Orchestra. They were here uh, in London recently this year, uh, no, end of last year, and they performed to a great acclaim. And uh, who is running this uh, show? A Kazakh uh, classic music uh, uh, virtuoso, Marat Bissingaliev. So this is the message we want to, uh, this type of messages we want to carry throughout the world. Of late, again, uh, related to UK, I'm not a fantastic, uh, fan of the uh, rap music, my younger son is, but uh, he told me that uh, uh, our producer, a very young 19-year-old producer, Iman Beck, he is known as Iman Beck, he made a remix of Roses. This is a very famous song by the star uh, 
rap singer, American rap singer, St. John. So this uh, remix uh, went into number one position in the UK's top 40 singles chart last March, as uh, uh, recent as last March. So uh, this is uh, how we try to uh, 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 project ourselves culturally. Or oh, for example, sports. Who does not know uh, Smirnov or Smiri in the skiing sport? Uh, this is our star. Or who does not know the famous uh, professional boxer uh, 3G, Golovkin, Gennady Golovkin? Or who does not know the uh, Astana cycling team, Astana pro team? So these are uh, the, uh, the ways we try to promote uh, and project Kazakhstan. Uh, of course, uh, 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 Paul, you mentioned the gastro diplomacy. Uh, we have to be quite cautious with Kazakh gastro diplomacy because we eat horse meat. We are nomads. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we step this uh, here very cautiously. I remember during the uh, London Olympics in 2012, there were media articles and reports that Kazakh team is so successful. We took the 12th, uh, I think, uh, very se uh, senior place in the chart. Uh, the local media were reporting that uh, Kazakh uh, sportsmen are so strong because they drink uh, maize milk, uh, kumis, and eat horse milk. So we started promoting that culture. <laughs> it takes time. It takes time. I will tell you that kumis milk uh, uh, is very famous now in uh, Europe. Uh, at the times of the, uh, when they were prisoner of war of the, after the Second World War in Kazakhstan, uh, Many locals uh, cured uh, prisoners of war with uh, maize milk, fresh maize milk. And uh, uh, of recent, uh, recently, a couple of years ago, no, maybe more than five years ago, a German, uh, a, German a, a grandson of the uh, prisoner of war, he remembered the story of how his uh, grandfather cured from cancer. Uh, he took that recipe of uh, Saumal, and now Saumal uh, production is a, a joint venture between Kazakhstan and Germany. And it is very popular in Germany, very popular in Switzerland, and Chinese tourists are uh, flocking in Kazakhstan to buy some mao. So this is our small, uh, 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 humble efforts in uh, gastro diplomacy. Uh, let me uh, uh, sum up what I'm saying. Uh, we, as I said, uh, we are newcomers, but we were very proud uh, to be invited to this global summit uh, on soft power, which produced a global first ever global report on. Uh, top uh, uh, soft power countries in the world. Uh, they have identified 60 countries and we have been entered in, out of, uh, as you know, more than uh, uh, 190 countries. And uh, we were within this uh, uh, group of 60 top countries uh, with the successful uh, soft power. Maybe within the rank of these 60 uh, uh, countries, we were at the lower side, uh, but uh, as I said, we are newcomers. Uh, but uh, we, uh, for example, uh, have taken uh, the 23rd ranking in uh, science and education, uh, but uh, we have been ranked 59 by the global familiarity. So it says it, it means that we have areas to uh, work on. Of course, uh, maybe soft power not the top top priority for Kazakhstan at the moment because soft power efforts require lots of resources, lots of instruments, uh, lots of uh, time. You know, but uh, we are aware of the importance of this. Uh, a delivery of the public good. We'll continue to focus on those areas which I identified. Uh, we'll uh, try to partner with uh, other countries. We'll use new uh, tools for that, digital tool. And uh, UK is a very great example how we successfully can use uh, the digital, digital tools to deliver, to deliver our public goods uh, from Kazakhstan as uh, a product of our soft power. And finally, I, I'd like to uh, conclude by this uh, maybe a bit alarming uh, uh, conclusion, because what we see today, particularly in the uh, 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 this uh, uh, virus uh, uh, havoc, is again a return to dangerous, uh, uh, a dangerous uh, um, uh, resort to uh, propaganda styles of power, uh, or even uh, fake news uh, type of uh, uh, soft power uh, uh, in the world. Uh, look what's uh, going on with this. Uh, uh, um, you know, scapegoatism, I call it scapegoatism or uh, witch huntism uh, in searching uh, the origins of the uh, coronavirus. War, was it uh, intentionally done or int unintentionally done? So we, 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 see all, we, we see all these uh, standoffs. They are so counterproductive. They are very counterproductive. We are strongly against uh, this uh, type of return to the Cold War type, uh, worst types of uh, soft power. 
we call uh, on all countries, particularly big countries, to uh, uh, rethink their approaches, to come uh, to the main essence of the soft power, trust building. What is lacking in the world, trust. Let me uh, recall uh, and bring you back to our chairmanship in uh, OEC in 2011. We were the first country to chair the OEC in, uh, from the post-Soviet space. And we were the first country to come uh, with a very clear logo or motto. We came uh, with the motto four T's. Four T's stood for uh, trust, transparency, tolerance, and tradition. So this, is, should, be the, this should be the essence of the uh, soft power uh, uh, today and in the future. We call on big countries, uh, particularly our great partner, the United Kingdom, to focus on those uh, four T's to make uh, the world uh, much better. We really uh, need a serious trust and a joint effort to build the uh, post-coronavirus world. This is a very serious uh, uh, wake-up call for all of us. Therefore, four T's, we believe, will contribute to save the world and build the new world. This is my uh, 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 prolongated Kazakh-style contribution to our discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Erlan, thank you very much indeed for that very uh, powerful message. Um, I always describe you as one of the great advocates for Kazakhstan. Well, you've just proved me correct. <laughs> so, um, we now, thank you, Alan. So we now move on, uh, and I have great pleasure in, in welcoming uh, Rowan Kennedy, um, who will be uh, talking to us from Almaty in, in Kazakhstan. Uh, Rowan, please proceed. Thanks, thanks, Rupert. Um, I've got some slides that I'm going to try and share. Um, so let me do that. And if you can tell me if you can see them, that would be great. Yep. Yep. Okay. Brilliant. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the work of the British Council and, and how we contribute to building some of that trust um, that, that, that Yolan mentioned. Um, I'm going to start uh, with a little bit of history because if the concept of soft power dates from 1990, uh, certainly as expressed by Joseph Nye, as we've heard, actually the concept of cultural diplomacy and cultural relations is much older. This is a picture of, um, of London in 1932 during the National Hunger March of unemployed workers. Um, and the 1930s were, um, as, as everyone will know, for, for much of the world, a time of economic difficulty, a time of rapid technological change. Um, so quite similar uh, in many ways to, to, to where we find ourselves today. Uh, there was the Wall Street crash, the Great Depression, there was a drop in international trade, a uh, fall in living standards, high unemployment and a rise in extreme ideologies, uh, all of which posed or were seen to pose a growing threat to British values, prosperity and security. And the British Council was created uh, in 1934 to help address this and to help counter this. Our initial focus uh, was on Europe and strategically important countries further afield. So some of the first places we opened were Portugal, Romania and Egypt. Um, but fast forward 86 years uh, and we've expanded. We're now, we now have a presence in 115 countries uh, worldwide. But we still have the same mission and we have the same values uh, at the core of what we do. Uh, and, and that mission is to create a friendly knowledge and understanding between the people of the, the UK and the people of the countries in which we work. And the way that we do this um, is by making a positive contribution to the countries we work in. So by aiming to change lives uh, through creating opportunities, through building connections and through creating trust. And we believe that, that uh, when we do this, it both enhances, it enhances the security, prosperity and influence of the UK, uh, but it also helps to make, make the world as a whole a better and a safer place. <clears throat> now we've heard, uh, we've heard different um, descriptions of what soft power is. Uh, this is the, the definition we tend to use at the British Council. And I think the, the key thing I'd like to draw your attention to here um, is that quite often a country's most attractive assets uh, are the things that are not the products of governments, but rather those of people, institutions uh, and culture. Uh, we call uh, what we do at the British Council cultural relations. Um, and I'm going to read a description of cultural relations that comes from um, a piece of academic work by Edinburgh University. So bear with me here. Cultural relations are reciprocal, non-coercive, transnational interactions between cultures, encompassing a range of activities 
that are conducted both by state and non-state actors within the space of cultural and civil society. The overall outcomes of cultural relations are greater connectivity, better mutual understanding, more and deeper relationships, mutually beneficial transactions, and enhanced sustainable dialogue between states, peoples, non-state actors, and cultures. To put that in simpler language, what we do is we use the cultural resources of the UK to engage with millions of people around the world and connect them to the UK. And when we say cultural resources, we mean a long list of things, but that includes uh, culture and the arts, it includes education, sport, science, creativity, and the English language. Um, and on the slide, you see sort of uh, the full spectrum of, 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 of power from soft power through to hard power, and you can see there uh, where cultural relations fit, fit, fits into that. Um, so a bit about the British Council, how, how we work, um, what sets us apart from other bits of the UK's international presence, um, and how this benefits the UK. Uh, we are a non-departmental public body. Um, that means that we are at arm's length from government. We're non-political. Uh, and these two things, um, because we receive some of our funding from government, these give us uh, a strategic alignment to government, but they also give us a certain degree of operational independence. Uh, we represent the whole of UK society, so all four UK nations, and we really aim to sort of represent the full diversity of, of, contemporary, of the contemporary UK. Uh, we're in it for the long term in the countries we work in. Uh, we firmly believe in, in mutuality, uh, so cultural relations is not a zero-sum game and everything we do uh, aims not just to benefit the UK, but also to benefit the countries uh, we work in. We have a particular focus, although it's not an exclusive focus, on young people, so on future, influence, future influencers and decision makers around the world. We have a mixed economy model. So as Paul mentioned, we're supported by the, by the Foreign Office. We receive a proportion of our funding uh, as a grant from the Foreign Office, and historically that's been around 15% in recent years. Um, and the rest of our, the rest of our funding uh, we earn either through full cost recovery contracts, through partnerships, or through teaching English and delivering exams. Um, and this fo the focus on young people and the ability to leverage external funding um, can often allow us to reach places and reach people that other parts of the UK overseas presence can't. So the British Council in Kazakhstan. Uh, we were opened in, in 1994, so last year was our 25th anniversary. Uh, we have offices in Almaty, in Nur Sultan, and in Atirao. We have 45 full-time staff, uh, two of whom are Brits uh, and the rest are Kazakhstani nationals, and the majority, about 30 or so, are based uh, in Almaty. Uh, we operate as two uh, entities, uh, with, firstly as the cultural and educational section of the embassy, uh, which runs our, our government and partnership funded work, uh, but we also, since 2015, we've had a local subsidiary that runs our commercial uh, work, which is mostly, mostly exams. And in the last financial year, we uh, reached just over two and a half million people across Kazakhstan. Uh, of those, 155,000 took part in one of our events in person. Uh, the rest we reached uh, online through digital channels or through uh, publication and through broadcast media. And we delivered 22,000 exams in 17 cities across Kazakhstan. In terms of our programming, in, in line with the commitment to mutuality, all of our programming uh, aims to bring the UK's cultural resources to bear to support Kazakhstan's own development goals. Uh, so primarily these are those set out in strategy 2050 and we have a real a really specific focus on supporting kazakhstan's um drive to transform its economy from an economy based on extractives to one that's based on knowledge so our current focus is largely um around english language teaching and learning and around um uh, enterprise skills education and training we work in partnership with a large number of organizations um, and in line with our mixed economy model uh, we're supported by uh, some of the biggest players in the economy, including Chevron, uh, Tengish Chevron and North Caspian Operating Company. Um, and what I'm going to do over the next couple of minutes is to try and give you a brief snapshot um, of, of some, although I won't have time to, to talk about all of the work we're doing in Kazakhstan um, at the moment. So let's talk about English first. In English language, our focus is really on supporting Kazakhstan to achieve, uh, on de deploying the UK's expertise to support Kazakhstan to achieve better standards of English teaching and learning uh, at all levels of the education system. So we provide professional development opportunities for teachers at schools, at colleges and at universities. And we also do some direct teaching for a particular groups of, of uh, influencers or future leaders in society. So. Currently, we're teaching English to Bolashak scholars. We give them their pre-sessional English training before they come to uh, the, U the UK or before they go overseas to study. 
uh, and we also teach English classes to Kazakhstani journalists in eight cities across the country. Um, this photo is from a project we're doing in uh, Mangistau region and it's providing professional development uh, activities for English teachers but also for teachers of science uh, who are now increasingly starting to teach in English as part of the trilingual education program. Uh, and this is a, a, a physics teacher called Beric who teaches in a school in Fort Shevchenko. Uh, this photo is from, a, uh, from our remote teaching project uh, in Atirao and what we're doing here is we're using UK and British Council remote teaching methodologies to bring uh, English lessons from internationally qualified teachers into classrooms in schools and in the university in Atirao and we're also providing mentoring uh, for the Atirao based teachers to help them improve their own teaching. Uh, in support of English learning um, and also to help unlock uh, educational opportunities overseas for, for, for young people from Kazakhstan, we offer exams. Uh, so as they said, we, did, we delivered 22,000 exams last year. Um, of about 13,000 of those were IELTS tests and the others included APTIS, uh, University of London and uh, ACC accounting exams, among others. Uh, we work with um, partners including Nazarbayev University, the Nazarbayev Intellectual Schools Network, uh, and the National Testing Centre, among others. And actually this photo I've cheated slightly, um, it's from a test centre in Istanbul, uh, because we don't have good quality pictures of our IELTS test centres in Kazakhstan uh, to hand, but one of the advantages of IELTS is that it's a standardised test, so it looks and feels uh, and, and works very much the same wherever you take it. So the, the other area where we focus a lot is, is enterprise and skills training, and this is very much again in support of Kazakhstan's drive to diversify its economy. Um, and we really focus on two areas where the UK has recognised expertise globally. Um, so that, uh, the first of those is social enterprise. Uh, and this photo was taken at a social enterprise hackathon we did for young people um, in Atirao uh, in February this year. The second uh, area is creative enterprise and the creative economy. Uh, and through our Creative Producers Programme, we offer training, including um, UK study visits for young uh, Kazakhstanis to help them organise successful cultural festivals and events. So this picture is of uh, London-based singer Hattis Noit, who performed in Almaty in February at a festival that was organised by the first group of alumni from that programme. Uh, creative enterprise is not just about new culture, though, and through our Crafting Futures Programme, uh, we're providing training for traditional craftspeople in Kazakhstan uh, to support them to form international connections, to develop their businesses and to develop the crafts sector uh, as a whole. This picture is from uh, a workshop we held with trainers from the Royal College of Art and Leicester University in Shimkent uh, in March. Um, and finally, just to say that uh, while the primary focus for us um, is, is on English and on enterprise, we do also work in other areas. So we work with universities, we work on youth leadership, civic engagement, um, and we also work to promote STEM education among young Kazakhstanis. And I thought I'd share this picture because it's, it's one I particularly like. Uh, the young man on the left is uh, Isak Mustopolo from, from Taraz in, um, in South Kazakhstan, who won uh, a British Council competition, um, a British Council science competition, and uh, mentioned to the judges when he collected his prize uh, that his dream was to meet Stephen Hawking. And in October 2017, uh, with some support from Aristana, we were able to make his dream come true uh, and he travelled to Cambridge to meet Professor Hawking. So just before I finish, um, a quick word about, about COVID-19. I mean, as, as an organisation whose purpose is bringing people together, uh, we've had to adapt quite significantly our activities to, to deal with social distancing, to deal with restrictions on travel. Um, I'm happy to say that we've successfully done this in Kazakhstan and um, most of our, the, all of our programs now do most of their activities um, online and that includes um, uh, an online version of the IELTS test. Um, the British Council, as I mentioned, was founded in, in challenging times uh, and in 2020 we, we find ourselves once again in challenging times. And it was, it was good to hear Paul mention that soft power is an important part of the UK's response to COVID-19. Uh, we very much agree because, uh, you know, as we start to now come out of the pandemic that's in many ways fragmented our world, it's kept people apart from each other. Um, we believe that there is uh, and there will continue to be a huge need and a huge desire for connection and for rebuilding of trust and relationships. Uh, and so the work of the British Council uh, and of our partners uh, is and will be more important than ever in the future. Thank you.
Rowan, um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for that. And um, congr congratulations on all the tremendous work you're, you're doing in, in Kazakhstan. It's a great um, tribute to you and your, and your team there. Um, so we now come on to the question and answer uh, side of this uh, webinar. And I think everyone's stuck very well to their timing. So we've, we've, we've got good time and we've had a large number of questions coming in uh, from our members and, and those involved in this webinar. And I'll um, pick out some of the key ones and then I will uh, perhaps put this to the most appropriate uh, panelists. The first question that's come in is, um, how important is the UK's P5 status for UK soft power? And did Kazakhstan ben benefit from semi-permanent membership? Um, Paul, could I put that to you first and then perhaps Erlan could uh, contribute on the second part of that question. Yes, I think, um, uh, of course, I mean, our, our permanent membership of the Security Council is hugely important to us. Uh, I, I think it, it means that we are in a place we want to be internationally. We are, a we are a country that thrives on being engaged internationally, on responding to the key challenges facing our planet, and clearly permanent membership of the Security Council gives us the ability to, to do that. I mean, we're cognizant that the world is, is changing, so um, you know, the, the, the United Nations, uh, of course, will, will must, must be reformed in, in line, in line with, with that, and we're, we're a part of the conversation around UN reform, but certainly our, our permanent membership of the Security Council is uh, an important asset for us, and we, we believe that with that comes a lot of responsibility, so it's an asset for us, but it behoves us to use it in a way that um, is responsible and engaged, and that's what we're trying to do. Thank you, Paul. Um, Erlan, could you could you contribute on because and you were very much part of um, uh, Kazakhstan's. Um, yes, uh, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I uh, can attest that uh, our Security Council membership, uh, non-permanent membership, was the culmination of uh, Kazakhstan's efforts in multilateral diplomacy. Uh, this was uh, building up uh, by our uh, ship chairmanship in uh, OEC. Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which I mentioned with 40s, uh, our chairmanship in uh, Organization of Islamic Conference. So we showed our balance and diversity uh, and uh, openness to all sides and spectrums of political thought, uh, uh, economic uh, practices, etc. Et Security Council was a, a fantastic uh, opportunity for Kazakhstan to project itself. And uh, we have been very serious uh, in producing a very powerful very convincing program uh, focusing on uh, key areas of uh, our concern and global concern and regional concern. Of course, uh, peacemaking and anti-nuclear efforts, global fight against terrorism and violence, uh, global fights against uh, climate change. All these global challenges were very strongly on our agenda. But we specifically focused to bring special uh, attention to Central Asia and the needs of Central Asia, the needs in security terms, the needs in uh, environment terms in uh, most important the needs in terms of economic development and we powerfully linked uh, the focus and highlight of Central Asia with Afghanistan. Uh, we have uh, made special arrangements uh, and special discussions at the very high level on Afghanistan and Central Asia. We arranged the first ever uh, in, in last uh, I think 20, 10 years trip by the Security Council to, the, uh, uh, to Afghanistan on the ground to meet uh, uh, local people. So. Uh, our security, uh, security Council membership uh, is not the past, I will tell you. It's a huge experience and Kazakhstan will continue to build on this uh, 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 international success uh, in its recent history. Thank, thank you very much, Erlan, for that. Um, the next question is, how does the UK's cultural reach, engagement and heritage actually translate into power? Are UK foreign policy ambitions achieved through these assets? Um, Rowan, can I ask you to start on that and then perhaps Paul could, uh, could add to it? Mm, I think, I mean, it, as, as I said, the UK cultural assets, um, 
sort of fall kind of fall squarely in the cultural relations that fall squarely into the sort of into the soft power part of the spectrum one thing that that, that we've done quite a lot of it at the british council is sort of some uh, research around how engagement with uk culture translates into increased trust uh, in the uk um and i sort of decided not to to, to to bore everyone with the statistics in my presentation but essentially the research shows that um, engagement with with uk culture translates into greatly increased trust in the uk which translates into an overall improved perception of the uk and also uh, some more kind of concrete things like um more willingness to do business with the uk more willingness to invest uh in the UK, more willingness to trade in the UK. So that's certainly one kind of one kind of measure. I mean, maybe I'll pass to Paul to say a little bit more about how, how it translates into into power. Thank, thank you, Rowan. Paul, Paul, could you contribute on on that sort of power equation of the question? Yeah. Yes, I mean, very much. As, as I, th I think the the event. Um, there is quite a lot of evidence that the more people know us, and and actually support our positions internationally. So I think some of the the data that that Rowan was was pointing to, showing that um, engagement with the UK, which can be um, lear learning learning English or engagement with UK cultural institutes or visiting the UK translates into a greater tendency to want to go to school in the UK to do business with the UK there's also quite a lot of evidence that it translates into a, a greater inclination to support UK positions internationally so so I think um, th there is you know there is quite a lot there that that actually you know those cultural links do support behavior which promotes our international or foreign policy objectives um thank you very much indeed paul um the next question is um the following kazakhstan is located in an important geostrategic area with powerful neighbors what is kazakhstan's soft power strategy towards russia and china um, Erlan, this is one for you, I think. Uh, in my uh, inter uh, intervention, I mentioned the, uh, our special focus on uh, history and nomadism, and we learn our lessons uh, from our uh, uh, distant uh, and recent past. We are nomads, and nomads uh, have an uh, inborn capacity to balance on a horseback. Therefore, our capacity to balance in the current world, in the turbulences of the current world, we can, will continue. Uh, to be perfected. Kazakhstan uh, is uh, famously known, by the way, it's another soft power tool, as the uh, multi-vector diplomacy country. Uh, we will continue to strike excellent, uh, excellent as possible relations with Russia, with China, our uh, nearest neighbors, with the United States, one of the global powers, with Europe, and within Europe, uh, with countries like the United Kingdom, uh, uh, Germany, France, and many others. Uh, I cannot mention all the 28, uh, 29 of our members of the uh, European Union. Of course, our Asian partners, our neighbor Iran on the Caspian Sea, India, Japan, uh, South Korea, and many others. So multi-vector is something which we took from our ancestors uh, uh, and we will continue to balance on the global horseback. Thank you very much, Alan. That's, uh, yes. uh, uh, that's excellent. Um, the next question, um, and this is really, I think, for Paul and Rowan, um, and it hasn't been covered actually in the keynote speeches to date. Um, to what extent is the royal family part of UK soft power? Paul, would you like to start on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a really good question, and there is, um, I mean, a lot of uh, polling, um, which is. A lot of polls which have sought to identify you know which are the really strong British brands internationally um, which are, you know which aspects of Britain are those which people around the world engage with in a very positive way um, show the royal family is very high on that on that list so I think typically at the royal family uh, the BBC, the Premier League, uh, are some of the the, the the kind of top British brands in soft power terms, uh, and that's 
I think has certainly been the, been been the case. I think wherever I have have served, I mean, including in Kazakhstan, but most recently in Romania, uh, His Royal Highness Prince Charles is a, is a close friend of Romania. He has property in the country. He visits uh, privately ev every year, and actually through that has become a huge kind of ambassador of the UK for uh, in 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 an, in Romania. Um, the, so the, the royal family is a huge asset, but of course is um, is a huge asset because um, it has particular it has a particular role. Um, visits of members of the royal family are not visits not like visits of, of ministers with with a government agenda. Um, they are real soft power visits, and they're they're all the stronger for that. Um, in, in addition to that, w would you? Sets that we can deploy on on the soft power front. Very, very much so, because I, I, and I think that's a reflection of the soft power strength of the of the royal family. So there is a, you know, there is a royal visits committee with very senior people on it. Uh, they liaise very closely with royal households in looking at the forward pattern of inward uh, visits to ensure that um, the soft power assets of the royal family are, are best used in terms of in terms of the, the, the UK's um, goals and goals and interests. Uh, Thank you Paul. Ro Roan, do, do, would you like to comment on your sort of on the ground experience related to the royal family and and how that plays out in Kazakhstan? Yeah I mean I, I, I agree very strongly with with what um, with what Paul, Paul says, I mean, my my um, my personal observation here, and I've, I've I've been here with the British Council for, for for six years, is that the royal family is very popular in in, in Kazakhstan, and, and and people, you know, I'm asked by, by 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 taxi drivers, by people I meet, you know, about, about sort of developments with the royal family. So I'd, I'd agree that, that they are a soft power asset, and they're also, of course, uh, and as Paul mentioned, they're, they're very active. Um, themselves in sort of making the most of that. Uh, we, we're very lucky at the British Council to have the Queen as our as our patron and Prince Charles as our vice patron. Um, so they're involved with our work, and we do uh, coordinate very very closely when we have uh, when we have royal visits um, to, to countries all around the world. Rupert, let me add. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I I can tell you that uh, our royal family has contributed to promoting uh, British soft power in Kazakhstan very seriously. Uh, almost all members of the royal family visited Kazakhstan, apart, uh, of course, for Her Majesty and Prince Philip. Uh, and we are very proud of that. And uh, Britain is very popular in Kazakhstan. Excellent. Th thank you, Alan. I think we've got time for probably two more questions. Um, there are two sort of related questions, which I shall read out, which is principally for you, Alan. And you've kind of covered these, but uh, it'd be interesting to get a... a, a your further view. Um, one is, is Kazakhstan's decommissioning of the old Soviet nuclear silos a lever of soft power? And then there's another question on, is the Boloshak scholarship program an instrument of soft power? Or is it more directed at creating a cadre of specialists to drive domestic progress in Kazakhstan? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, on uh, nuclear, yes, uh, as I said, uh, this is uh, our uh, number one priority in our global uh, international security efforts, we will continue to press on uh, achieving the global uh, uh, the, the uh, nuclear free world. Actually, uh, that's in the uh, uh, major manifesto which uh, President Nazarbayev came up at the uh, United Nations General Assembly a couple of years ago, where the focus is to uh, make the world nuclear free, or free of nuclear weapons uh, by the centenary of the United Nations. So that will continue to be uh, uh, our uh, top priority and we use it not only as a soft power, soft power is one aspect of that, but this is a very important policy, foreign policy goal for Kazakhstan. As far as Boloshak uh, is concerned, this is a two-edged uh, 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 situation. First of all, of course, we are building a new human capital in Kazakhstan through the massive uh, education program called Bolashak, 
but uh, Bolashak also opens uh, new gates for scientific and educational cooperation. And in that way, uh, it uh, promotes Kazakhstan's, Kazakhstan's uh, achievements in science and, in, and in education. Uh, let me give you the example. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had the, another big uh, uh, video conference uh, on uh, sustainable development arranged by the uh, uh, Association of uh, PhD uh, uh, Doctors uh, in UK and they number more than 100 uh, in the United Kingdom. I'm, I'm very proud of them and I'm very actively uh, cooperating with them. Uh, we had a very uh, powerful and very useful, uh, very informed uh, video conference on uh, science arranged by our students. So these are the tools both to uh, build new human capital in Kazakhstan and promote what Kazakhstan in, is doing in science and uh, education. Rupert, uh, could I, yes, could please, I comment right. on Bolashak quickly? Yeah, I, I was going to say, I, from, from our experience, um, and we do a lot of work with, with, with UK universities, sort of helping them to recruit students from Kazakhstan. I think Bolashak's had, it, had, had a, certainly in, in, the UK, in the university and academic sector in, 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 in the UK, Bolashak's have been an enormously powerful soft power tool for Kazakhstan because all U, UK universities know about it. They're very keen on, on sort of engagement with Kazakhstan, in part, I think, because of the Bolashak program. And then the other thing to say is that, you know, these students who are the kind of brightest and, and the best uh, young Kazakhstanis who come and who spend time um, in, in the UK, I think are fantastic ambassadors for Kazakhstan while they're in the UK. And, you know, we've heard that feedback from, you know, both from, from the university community, but also from, from, from a much wider community that engages with them when they're in the UK. Um, thank you, Rowan. I think we've got uh, time for just one more question. And this is a, a general question which has been touched on already and um, uh, really applicable to all, all our panellists. The question is, is the importance of soft power for the UK and Kazakhstan increasing given the current COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Um, Paul, do you want to kick off on that one? Yes, I think, um, as I say, I mean, I think the, the natural instinct of all, of all countries faced by uh, COVID has absolutely done um, the recognition that this is um we we've got uh paul we've got a problem with your internet connection i think yes um uh, 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 perhaps I'll go on to you, Erlan, on, on yes, that. Yes, uh, while you fix with Paul, uh, very shortly, uh, we uh, now read and uh, see many comments and many uh, uh, wise people uh, talking about this uh, pandemic situation and most importantly uh, about the post-pandemic world. And uh, uh, the majority of them are of, of an alarming nature. Uh, we definitely know that we will, we will live in a different world Therefore, uh, Paul is a very senior diplomat in the Foreign Office. Uh, he is a, a well-seasoned diplomat, uh, 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 having uh, worked in different countries, including Kazakhstan. So my message to Paul, as a representative of the UK government, uh, which is the P5 member in the Security Council, uh, let me reinforce once again Kazakhstan's message. We need to bring four Ts. Uh, to, global, uh, to global discourse and practice. Trust, transparency, uh, tolerance and tradition. Uh, we know that uh, uh, there is a, an effort to build the P5 uh, uh, a video meeting. Uh, there are uh, certain uh, 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 challenges to arrange that. Therefore, we call on them to meet as soon as it is possible and to talk about genuine cooperation, to talk about working together instead of accusing each other, suspecting each other. That's the main call of uh, President Nazarbayev and President Tokayev to all big powers. We wholeheartedly support that effort. And uh, we call on you, uh, Paul, 
to bring the 4T concept uh, to the meeting of the P5 countries in the near future. Uh, and thank you very much indeed. Very, um, uh, very good message there. Um, Rowan, do you want to just um, finish off on COVID-19? Have you got any Sorry, comments? Sorry, yeah, there? Rupert, I, I think I, I was lost. I, did, did you kind of lose me at, at a certain point? We, we, we did, Paul, uh, probably halfway through, and then Erlan picked up, um, picked up the uh, baton, as it were. But do, do just complete what you were saying. I think we didn't hear the last part of your answer. <laughs> How far, how far did you get in terms of what I was saying? Um, well, you, the very beginning, the very beginning. Yes, you, you, you started talking about the difficulty, but then we didn't hear what the solution was. So, yeah, I think I was, so I was saying that, that the kind of initial response was a very, um, you know, of all governments, I think inevitably was a kind of transactional one, uh, really focusing on how do we get PPE we need for our health services, how do we get our people back, but I think that's rapidly um, changed as there's a recognition that this is a global pandemic, it requires an unprecedented global approach, including a global search to, uh, to find the vaccine, to, uh, to address the, 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 the challenges. I think we've seen, seen that in the uh, the pledging conference that was took place earlier this week with our Prime Minister very, very active. And I would certainly sort of pick up on, on uh, Erland's point. I think it's a really important one. Um, th this is a challenge which will require um, the international community to work together in a spirit of trust, one of Erland's key T's, a spirit of cooperation rather than, than competition. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, uh, Rome, would you like to just add anything to that? that yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I touched on this at, at the end of my presentation. I mean, I think you know we, we will be, as as my colleagues have said, we will be living in a in, in a different world um, when we when we emerge from this. We're not quite yet sure what that world will look like, but I think one thing that we are sure about is that where the pandemic has resulted in um, sort of uh, in less connection uh, be be between countries, between um, individuals, between institutions. We uh, um, believe that there is a, a real appetite and a real need for more connection and where the pandemic has um, has hurt trust and we've heard a bit about sort of fake fake news. There's also been some really unpleasant in various countries around the world um, sort of outbreaks of, 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 of persecution and, 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 and um, racism. Um, we we believe there's there's a real need to to rebuild that trust. So I think soft power and particularly cultural relations has has a huge role to play in that. So we see it we yeah we see it being being as important if not more important um, in helping to deal with the the, the uh, effects of the pandemic. Uh, Rome, thank you very much indeed. Well, look, it it, it um, it's been a fascinating discussion, and um, we at the BKS have been delighted to convene this uh, webinar on behalf of all our members and um, on behalf of our members, directors and, and Jean to our membership secretary, could I thank all our guest speakers for taking part. Uh, it really has been a fascinating uh, discussion uh, and provided significant insight. Um, there are a large number of questions that we haven't been able to cover, so perhaps we uh, need to reconvene um, on this subject because it's obviously uh, generated a huge amount of... Um, well, let's come back after the lunch break. <laughs> <laughs> um, and could I also thank our, our directors, Roger Holland, Jeffrey Temple, our operations director, who's been much involved in putting this together, David Skills, Fergus Robertson, Indira Hani, and of course, um, Jean Toi, who's um, been the sort of uh, fulcrum for for all of this um, and also if I could thank our key sponsor Samrook uh, Casino. So many thanks to you all. I hope we will reconvene again uh, very shortly, perhaps even face to face uh, next time and um, stay safe, stay healthy and uh, we'll be in uh, close contact and uh, thank you for all your support of the British Kazakh Society. Thank you very much uh, Rupert for the excellent opportunity. Uh, all the best to all and uh, Paul we have a small plan between us. I hope that we'll realize that plan at better times. Absolutely. That would, that would be a dream. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All the best. All the best.